Hey folks, it's Nate. It's been a while. You remember me? Remember that podcast thing we used to do? Well, I've been thinking about making some other content for Iron Sysadmin. You may have seen some blogs about it. So I've been thinking lately. A lot of times folks like me that have been in this for a long time, they kind of forget what the newbies need to know. They kind of forget what it was like to be new. And uh, they kind of forget what they have in muscle memory, right? Because you just sort of assume it's a certain base level. Well, I've decided I want to start making some content for that base level. So tonight, we're gonna go through and we're gonna install Fedora. Just like plain old, nothing crazy. We're gonna take my Alienware machine, which I bought about two years ago. It's a gaming rig, obviously, it's an Alienware. Um, I use it primarily for media production and gaming. And I've always wanted to put Fedora on it, but I've never wanted to sacrifice the space. So recently, I picked up an, an internal hard drive. It's not in there. It's in the machine already. And I'm gonna put Fedora on it, and I'm gonna show you how to take a Windows 11 machine, install Fedora on that secondary drive, and still retain dual boot. So you can still get back to Windows if you want to. It's a perfect situation for folks who are brand new to Linux and really just don't know where to get started. They don't wanna give up that familiar Windows desktop. It's a big step to jump straight on into Linux in a whole new environment. So tonight, I'm gonna hope, I'm gonna hopefully show you a little bit about how you can keep that safety net, but still experience something new and I think awesome with Fedora. Which Fedora, by the way, not a bad desktop. I've been using it for years, not because I work at Red Hat, but since long before. I was a Red Hat Linux user before Fedora existed. When Fedora Core came out, I moved along with them at around Fedora Core 2, and I've been a Fedora user ever since, long before I was ever a Red Hatter. It's a great desktop. All right. I've talked enough. Let's get started. All right, so we're gonna see how well this works. Um, I'm currently, I've got the output of my desktop into OBS, and that's the only way I can see it display is through OBS. <laughs> the first thing you're gonna need is a USB stick to put the uh, installer for Fedora on, okay? Uh, that's actually easier than it sounds. You go to the Fedora Project's website, which I think is just fedoraproject.org, and on the Fedora Project website, you want to download the Fedora Media Writer. There's a version for Windows, there's a version for Mac, there's even a version for Linux. So if you're already on Linux and want to try Fedora, you can go get that one. Uh, Mac, Windows, whatever. Now, you can install Fedora on an Intel Mac. I don't know if you can do it on an M1 Mac. Uh, it's not easy. So this is specifically for, I'm talking about Windows, right? Uh, now, you can use a Mac to download and set up this USB stick and install it on a PC, but I'm rambling at this point. My point is, it's really easy. You open up the Fedora Media Writer. It asks you what spin of Fedora, because there's a bunch, you want to download. I went with the standard Fedora workstation, and it'll ask you where you want to burn it to. Now, be careful. It'll burn it to anything it sees on your USB bus. It'll ask you, of course but I actually accidentally wiped out the, the card for my camera <laughs> because it was writing to this and somehow got confused when I plugged in my uh, SD card reader and I lost some pictures. So, uh, kind of embarrassing. Anyway, we're gonna show you my desktop quick. Um, I have it open to Windows Disk Manager and the reason I, didn't, I did that is to show you that it sees a new disk. It's asking me to initialize the disk. So that means that, hey, look, I see a brand new disk and I'd like to initialize it. We do not want to initialize it. I only showed you this so that you can see, um, you know, that my machine sees a brand new disk. So we're going to cancel that. We're not going to do that. And down here, you'll see disk number two with a little red box over it, basically saying, I don't know how to use this thing because it's unallocated, completely empty disk. There's no partitions on it. We're going to let Linux do that during the installer. So we're going to close that. Um, this, you can see this is a fully functional Windows 11 machine. This is my desktop machine. Uh, that's my background, my applications, all my stuff. So I don't want to lose any of this. It is backed up. And I'm going to caveat all of this with back up your stuff. If you don't have your stuff backed up, you could accidentally lose data. You don't want to do that. So we're going to take our USB stick and I'm going to plug it into one of the USB drives or USB ports on the front of my tower. And we're going to try to install Linux. So it's 
plugged in, Windows may pop up and say like, I see a drive I don't know how to use, because it doesn't recognize it, but we're not gonna care about that. We are going to reboot. Now, I gotta remember the button I need to press. I think it's F12 or F11 on this machine to uh, get it to bring up the boot menu. Your machine will be different. If it's a Dell like this one, it'd be the same keys, F11, F12. I think it's F12. Hopefully it'll tell me, I forget if it tells me. I'm gonna start hitting F12 like now. I think I saw it say boot. There we go. Now this is a UEFI boot menu. Um, most modern machines are UEFI. So you'll probably have something similar. Wow, this is a really responsive mouse. We're gonna go USB one, UEFI OS SanDisk. I know that's the brand of my USB stick. So that's how I know this is the right one to pick. Yours will obviously be different. Now, this is impossible to read. Uh, it's gonna ask me, I know what these options say. Uh, hopefully in the video, they're easier to read. But basically there's two options here. One says test media and install, and the other says install. I'm gonna do test media and install just so you can see what it looks like. It basically does a signature check, GPG, not GPG. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It does a checksum test against the install media before it starts the installation process. That way you know that it is clean and it's ready to go, right? Not only has it not been tampered with, does it say fail error? Okay, we're gonna try this again. We're gonna skip the media test this time. I have found the media test to be finicky. If this won't boot, then we'll know there is in fact a problem with the media. I know the media is good because I downloaded it right from Fedora just earlier today. Uh, the question is gonna be whether it's in some way corrupt, but we'll see what happens here. Okay. This is kind of a cool feature of UEFI. It takes your UEFI boot splash and it, it puts it into the boot screen for most Linuxes, not just uh, Fedora. Looks like it's booting though. Let's give it a second. There we go. Now what this is gonna do is gonna bring us into a live USB environment for Fedora. Um, we can either install Fedora right off the bat or we can click not now. If you click not now, it'll bring you into a live installation of Fedora, which in which you can try it out. This is a great way to tell if your hardware works with Fedora or not. I'm gonna go ahead and click install now. Now I do wonder if I can, bring up settings and increase my, change the scaling to 200 and see what happens. Oh, that's so much better. I can read, I can see now guys. You have no idea how hard that was to read on this little screen. Maybe you do know, maybe it's just as bad in the recording, I don't know. Okay, so we're gonna go English and hit continue because I speak English, obviously. They don't have an option for bad English, otherwise I'd pick that. All right, installation destination. This is, you know, where do you wanna install to? Now we're gonna see, that's the NVMe. I don't think it sees my drive. It's not showing me the Western Digital drive I added. All right, we are gonna cancel this. I think there's a BIOS setting, some sort of like, um, There's a BIOS setting that it's like a performance mode for the disk controller. Two for setup, yes, there we go. We may have to change that. So this is good, you know, some trial and error. All right, I think. It's hard to work with the mouse here. Oh, no. Virtualization, integrated NIC, SATA operation, RAID on. Is that the problem? This operation configures the operating system mode integrated SATA hard drive controller. 
I turn off raid. It's the SATA. Okay, we're not going to touch any disks. In fact, we're not going to boot Fedora. What I'm going to do is boot back into Windows and make sure my data is still there. If it's not, we're going to turn that back and hope I didn't destroy anything. <laughs> so the way this machine is configured, there is a onboard NVMe drive. That's where Windows is installed. It's the fastest option, right? Windows boots ridiculously quick because of it. There's a secondary SATA drive, which is a spinning disk, and that is used for longer term storage, large things, things that don't require the speed. Those are both used by Windows. I've added an SSD to the SATA bus. The SATA bus is what that was just talking about. So what I want to find out now is, if I log back into Windows, let's make sure that my D drive still shows here. If it does not, then I got to turn that option back on and we may be stuck. There's D. There's my data. Cool. All right. We are good to go, I think. If I reboot now, I will theoretically see my other disk. I'll reboot. Okay. Back to my cruiser. Skip that media test. I'm going to install Fedora. We're also going to go back into the settings here. That's the other cool thing. You can get into the full desktop settings. So you can do things like set up your network. Okay. Turn that off. Now. Be able to try to install. It's still hard to see this mouse, I'll tell you. All right, continue. Now let's see if it sees more disks. We're gonna go destination. There, this looks better. So SDA should be my spinning disk, two terabytes, that sounds right. SDB is about a terabyte, and that's the size of the SSD that I put in. We're gonna pick him. Let's do... Automatic is probably okay. Let's do advanced. Just so I can show you how the partition manager works. We hit done, it should bring us to partition management. Okay, so this is the GUI based partition manager. Now, back in the early days, when I got started with all this stuff, we had nasty looking text based partition managers. And after that, we had text, like TUI, text user interface partition managers. So partition managers are, they've come a long way. So what, what will end up in here, um, you don't have to do this manually. There are reasons you might want to do it manually, but for just like a desktop that you're just going to sit down and learn Linux on, it doesn't really matter that much. If you're building a server, that's totally different. There are cases where you absolutely want to have separate partition layouts. We're going to make a UEFI partition. I guess this is a good learning experience. Okay, so let's make a partition table, GPT. That's cool. UEFI likes GPT. Now we're going to make a partition, XT4. I wonder if we have to label it for this. Actually, I want to make it a UEFI partition. EFI system partition. I forget how big that needs to be. It does not need to be a terabyte, that's for sure. Go with a gigabyte? I don't know.
Okay, then we need to make a boot partition. Gonna select free space and then click plus. Boot can be ext4. And then it's usually good practice. Oh, it made it the whole terabyte, didn't it? Edit. Resize. This device cannot be resized. <laughs> okay. Then we will undo the last action. I don't like this new editor. I'm just going to say that. Okay, boot doesn't need to be huge. Only reason it was huge is because I forgot to change it. It can actually be like 500 meg or smaller. Especially since a lot of the important data ends up on EFI. And unless I'm mistaken, this will warn you if you make it too small. Okay, so now we've got boot, we've got boot EFI. Now we're gonna make a volume group for the rest. This is kind of best practice. Uh, in my opinion, it's best practice. Uh, we're gonna change this from partition to LVM volume group. And we're gonna let it be the whole size of the disk and we're gonna call it, my machine's name is Escanor. We'll call it VG Escanor. Common practice is to put VG before your volume group names, just so you know it's a volume group when you're looking at storage later. Uh, I'm not going to bother to encrypt it, but just know that you can if you want to. We're going to hit OK. All right, now what we should be able to do is within VG Escanor make logical volumes. If this works the way it's supposed to work. How do I make a logical volume? Yeah, that's LVM. Or do I have to go here? There we go. Now we can make a logical volume within. So you see over here on the side, a volume group shows up in a lot of different interfaces as like its own disk because it essentially is. It's a logical volume, right? Just like a disk is a volume. So now we can make logical volumes within the volume group, right? A volume group is a logical volume group. So we're gonna make a logical volume. We're gonna call it slash. We're gonna call it LV underscore root. What this should do is it'll put all of the rest of the disk allocated to slash, which is the root of your file system. Now, the way this works, this might be a little confusing, right? What are these mount points? What are these names? Linux, so Windows treats all of your drives as drive letters, and within there, there's a directory tree. Uh, Linux treats it a little bit differently. Instead of having a drive letter, there's a root volume, slash. Everything beneath that is a directory or a file. Everything, devices or files, everything's a file. Disks get mapped into directories within root. So slash is now this whole, this whole volume is going to be slash. Boot, if you remember I made a volume for boot, that's where it stores boot configuration and boot information. That is going to end up in slash boot. Now slash boot is not files within slash, it's files within the disk that I've assigned to the mount point slash boot. Slash boot EFI is yet another partition. So within slash boot, you'll find another folder directory called EFI, and that'll be that other device, right? And there are ways to tell whether a folder or a directory is a device or not. We're not gonna go into that today. Uh, but just realize that that is sort of the structure. Instead of having drive letters, it's a lot more like Mac OS. Mac OS treats them in a similar way. Um, although you can see the separate volumes and whatnot within macOS. But macOS at its core 
is a Unix slash Linux base. It's BSD, I think, technically. All right, we're gonna hit okay. And what this should do is it'll make VG root. If you were making a server or you had specific use cases, you might make slash var its own partition. You might make slash law or slash var log its own partition. You might make slash root its own partition or slash home its own partition. There's lots of reasons why you would do these things. I'm trying to keep this simple. It doesn't need to be that isolated for this particular use case. There's performance reasons you might do it. There's security reasons you might do it. None of those are valid on this particular machine. So, all right, we should be done configuring the disks. So we are gonna now click done. It should no longer give me an error. If it does give me an error, it'll give me an idea what I need to change. Oh, error. Okay, click for details. What do you not like? Failed to find a suitable stage one device EFI system partition, but I made one. Must be mounted on boot EFI. Oh, lowercase EFI. So we'll go back to disks over here, SDB. Remember we made boot EFI. We're gonna edit this guy. Edit mount point. And it's boot lowercase EFI. Set mount point. Now if we click done, let's see. Still a problem, what do you not like? Slash boot partition is less than 512 meg. Uh, that's gonna mess everything up. Information about the selected device. Isn't there like an auto create stuff? No, I'm gonna have to delete the whole volume group or shrink it maybe. Can I shrink VG Escanor? Why can't it be resized? Format scheduled to be created, cannot be resized. Okay, well then we'll delete it. We'll make it again. Now the reason I think it's best practice to make a volume group is volume groups take physical disks and sort of split them up. Or I should say, makes them, makes them virtual, uh, which means you can extend them later or you can change them or resize them. Okay, it won't let me resize this either. I'm just gonna have to delete this and make it again. Now, theoretically, we will no longer have, oops, come back here. Errors. Let's see. Own of truth. There we go. Okay, so this is this is confirming all the changes that are about to be made to the disk. We're gonna go accept. Okay, installation destination. We have set. You know what it didn't do? It didn't ask me where to configure the bootloader. So you kind of guess? It used to ask you, I haven't done a dual boot system in a long time, but it used to ask you where the bootloader should be installed. All right, I guess we're gonna see how it goes. Yep, accept changes. All right, let's make sure it's not touching. It doesn't tell me what devices it's working on. Oh, there, STB3, STB3, STB2. WD blue, yep, okay, accept changes. Okay, date and time is already set to New York. It should automatically use NTP. Yep, so that's good. We're gonna hit done there. We should be good to go. Keyboard's already set up for US, begin installation. Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna lay down all the basic um, packages that come with Fedora. Um, it used to be that it let you go through this whole process where you could pick what packages you wanted installed and whatnot. Now it kind of turns that around. And what it does is it lays down the basics, uh, gets you a desktop environment that you should be able to boot into. Once you're booted into it, you can then tell it 
uh, what things to install by using the software uh, app, right? The packages app. And that goes and gets it through DNF, which is the package manager that comes with Fedora. So I'm gonna sit here and be quiet so that we can speed this up and I'll be back. In a So there we go. It is finished installing packages. That didn't, that wasn't too painful, right? Now we're going to hit the finish button and what it should do is finish up the installation and reboot. And we'll find out if our, I guess it doesn't reboot, reboot automatically. It's finished what it was doing. Um, finished the, you know, the installation that we asked it to do within the live environment. Then it brings us back to the live environment. So what we should do now is just tell it to reboot and it should boot into our Fedora environment, assuming it put the bootloader where we needed it to be. I don't know if it did. <laughs> We're gonna find out. Restart. Yep, restart. Here we go. Now this should reboot not using the USB stick because I'm not gonna tell it to use the USB stick. So if it comes, comes to Windows, it didn't. Yep, Fedora. I think that says Windows Boot Manager. It's hard to read, but I think it says Windows Boot Manager. So we could still boot into Windows if we want to. But we're gonna pick Fedora. And just to show you, there's no trickery. Here's my USB stick. Back on my desk. Now this should boot up into Fedora. Now, even if this brings us to a graphical user interface like it's supposed to, we're still not technically done. Um, well, first of all, it's gonna bring us through a fir first boot wizard, which uh, lets us configure a few things, which is cool, so we're gonna do that. But the other thing that we haven't done yet is set up things like my graphics adapter. Uh, this does have an NVIDIA graphics card in it. Like I said, it is an Alienware gaming rig. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna go through and do that in this particular video or not. Maybe we'll poke around at it a bit, and if it looks like I can get it set up easily enough, um, we will. Usually what I do is I look online because the instructions for this evolve over the years. Last time I did it, it was an AK mod. You just installed it. It auto would it would automatically rebuild the driver whenever your kernel was updated because that's the rub with NVIDIA. Um, there's not a packaged driver that does all the 3D prettiness. There is a packaged open source driver called Navu which makes things work, but you don't get the 3D graphics and all the features of your card. Okay, we're back to the point where I can't see my mouse because it's too little, here it is. All right, we're gonna go in here before we do anything. Let me get up to the menu and we will increase that. It'll let us know, that's gonna make it shut off. We wanna go to configuration, it doesn't give us that. Or is that that? No, that takes a screenshot, we don't want a screenshot. No, we can't configure it. We're just going to have to squint. All right, so this lets us pick a Wi-Fi network. I'm not going to pick Wi-Fi because we're on Ethernet. Privacy, you can choose what you want to share, I think. All right, recording, yeah. Sorry, like I said, hard to read. I'm going to leave those on. Third-party repositories, let's let it turn those on. These will be extra package repositories that will let us install extra things like that NVIDIA driver that I was talking about. You don't have to turn them on if you don't want to. But there's that like uh, VLC. VLC is a good one. In the past, it's always been that VLC that comes with Fedora it doesn't have all of the plugins that you want. VLC from third-party repositories will. Fedora is very strict about including only software that is fully that is licensed in the proper way. And by proper, I think it's GPL and maybe a handful of other licenses. If they're not licensed in that way, then Fedora doesn't include them. Okay, we're not gonna set up a Google account or anything like that. You can do this, and then it'll integrate things like Nextcloud and Google Drive with your file manager, which is kind of cool. We're gonna skip that for now. I, can, I know how to set that up later. All right, um, who, who am I? I'm Nate. 
I'm gonna make my usual username of Gangriff. Did I spell that right? I can't read it. G A N G I F. Okay, it's probably gonna make me set a password. Okay, I hope I typed that right, because I'm, well, here, I'm gonna show it so I can read it. Now, this new way of doing this, notice it didn't ask me for a root account. That's because root is locked. Root, if you're not familiar, is the, sort of the operator, the systems administrator, the, the God account on any Linux box. The default for Fedora and many other distributions nowadays is that the root account gets locked. If you know how, you can unlock it, um, not during the setup wizard, but you can unlock it through other means so that you can log in with log in as root directly. But there's really no reason to do that because this first user that it's setting up is going to have what's called pseudo access, which eventually, which essentially gives them the possibility to do anything they want as root. But they have to authenticate to do it. It's sort of like on windows when you have to click that button that says run this, admit, run this as an administrator or yes, allow this, what does it call that? UAC, user access control? Um, except it's a different mechanism, but the same concept. All right, so that should be good. We're gonna hit next. All done, start using Fedora. And here we are at our desktop. Welcome to GNOME 44. Uh, we're not gonna take a tour. You can take a tour if you want to, if you're, if you're doing this. What I am gonna do is change that scaling so we can see. Go back into settings here. Pseudo displays scaling 200%. That's better. Keep changes. Now I can see. I'm gonna get a headache from doing this, I'm, I'm telling you. All right, so now if I were to open up Firefox, uh, I should theoretically already be online and ready to do things. Yeah, Firefox privacy notice. Now we're gonna look up on Fedora 38. So that's what we just installed. PCI, yep. Let's get a terminal. NVIDIA Corporation GA186. GeForce RTX 3060, that's exactly what I've got, cool. Force 2 through GeForce 4, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, just AK Mod NVIDIA. So this is what I was talking about with sudo. At the command line, you just preface your command with sudo. So sudo dnf install akmod dash nvidia. So at this point, I spent a bunch of time trying and eventually failing to get the nvidia drivers set up on this machine. Um, I did think I got it working, and in fact, the uh, the actions you're going to see me performing here are most of the steps you need. But there is a piece about uh, getting the driver signed so that Secure Boot can recognize it. Otherwise, the kernel can't load it. That's a security feature that if you have Secure Boot turned on, uh, the, the driver has to be signed by a key that the system knows about, and you have to import that key into your uh, Secure Boot environment. And I didn't do any of that. I thought I had it working, and in fact I didn't. So instead of showing you a bunch of trial and error, I'm just going to skip kind of through this. There is going to be a link in the description of the video for uh, how to on how to get exactly all that that I just described done. Basically, 
you install the uh, extra repositories, which I did during setup, but you can you can enable later if you uh, did not do it during setup. So you need the RPM Fusion um, repository. Then you update your system. Make sure you do that first. I didn't do it first, and then I had to go back and do it anyway. Uh, once that's uh, up to date, then you install AKMod, well, reboot, and then you want to install AKMod-NVIDIA. What that'll do is it'll build a, uh, it'll build the driver once it's installed. It basically gets like a source chunk, and then it'll let you build that driver uh, from source against the kernel that you're running, which is why you need to update first. Once you have that running, that's when you have to go through and do the piece where you're signing the driver. And like I said, I'm gonna put a link to that all in the description of the video here. So uh, instead of going through what I just described, just follow the how-to and that'll, that'll get you set up. I did it later, works perfectly. Now that we have the system up and running, uh, why am I here? Like, why do I care about Linux? Um, personally, I care about Linux because it's a free operating system. And I don't mean free like it doesn't cost you anything, although that's also true in the case of Fedora. It's not the case for every Linux. What it does mean is um, it's free as in freedom, which means that all of the software that's included with Fedora is open source. And you can go find a copy of that code you can go commit changes to that code. Um, you can basically be involved in communities that help affect change for your particular operating system. That's power and that's freedom and that's pretty awesome. You should be excited about that uh, in the same way that I'm excited about that. But even if you're not excited about that, personally, I think that from a desktop usability and even development standpoint, this is just a superior workspace. Um, you get direct access to the shell in a, the same shell you might expect to find on the most common web server on in the world, right, Linux. Um, you can do your, your development and testing. You can run containers. Uh, I mean, the stuff is endless. Uh, that's all maybe more advanced than you care about at the moment, though. So we're going to talk about some simple stuff, like what if I want to go install some software? There's this software thing right here. This will bring up essentially very similar to like the Windows Store, if you're familiar with that, or the Apple, I think they call it the Mac or the App Store on uh, Apple's machines. Um, and through here, you can find things to install. Now, I'm kind of curious, can I get like Steam through here? I don't think I can. But one of the things I want to know about, oh, you can also install updates through here. I did, I did that all through the command line. You don't have to. You can do it through here. Uh, you can also do in-place upgrades. So when Fedora 39 comes out, there'll be a banner at the top here that you can say, I'd like to upgrade to Fedora 39. And it'll just download all the updates that'll get you to Fedora 39 and do an in-place upgrade. And boom, you'll have Fedora 39 after an update. Now, I don't know if Steam is listed in this store. I'm trying to remember how to search somewhere. There it is. Little guy up here. Let's see if Steam is here. I don't think Steam's here. It is here. Steam link. Steam. Launcher for Steam. Coming from RPM Fusion. Let's install Steam. One of the reasons I wanted to do this on this machine is because because I've got a laptop here, a framework, which runs nothing but Fedora. This is where I do most of my like Linuxy stuff. I even connect this to this monitor that I'm currently doing this recording through uh, so that I can get a decent sized desktop. But I can't game on this. This doesn't have a 3D graphics card. I'm really curious if I can game on Linux now. It's one of those dreams I've always had. 20 years ago when I was gaming on Windows, I really wanted to game on Linux and I couldn't because the industry wasn't there. Um, Steam on Linux, Steam on the Steam Deck, Steam with Proton, has opened up so many doors for gaming on Linux. And I've ever since I got this Alienware and I've, I've wanted to put Linux on it, specifically because I want to see what the state of gaming on Linux is today. So anyway, that's why I've chosen to install Steam here. Not only as an example of things that you can install, but um, because I wanted to install Steam. This is going to take a little bit of time. 
Now, it doesn't give you much output. I don't know if we click on this, will it? That'll cancel it. Yeah, we'll cancel it. Be nice if we had some debugging output so we knew what was going on here. I click back, does it cancel it? I hope not. Where did it go? Did I go back, is it still going? I don't usually use this thing. Oh, there we go, it's still going. So we can browse around while it's doing this. So, um, I don't know. What if we want an office suite? Let's go to work. This may not work because it's in the middle of doing something. I don't think it's going to work because it's in the middle of installing Steam. Okay. We'll stop trying to ask it to do things. There. Oh, did it finish installing Steam? These are all the things that are already installed that you can remove. I mean, you can remove anything, right? If you're on Linux and you're like, I'm going to remove the kernel, it'll let you. Maybe you've seen the memes. Here we go. Steam. It's installed now. I'm going to try to open it and see what happens. Steam setup. Sweet. That's going to do some installing. Let's move this off to the side of the screen here. I'll go back to showing you uh, software packages and whatnot. Go back to explore. Like I said, what if you want like an office suite? It may have already, oh, GNU Cache. That's like a finance suite. I haven't used it in years. I use an online thing now. LibreOffice, that's already installed. Let me show you LibreOffice. Um, LibreOffice is basically an open uh, Microsoft Office alternative. Let's go. LibreOffice Writer. So you might be wondering like, oh, I want to do some word processing. This looks just like classic Word before they went to the, the ribbons layout that they have in Microsoft Office nowadays. Now you won't get things like Exchange, but to be honest, not Exchange, Outlook is what I'm looking for. But to be honest, most of that stuff's done via web applications now anyway. All of that works just fine on Linux, the same as it would on um, on Windows, right? So if I were to fire up Firefox down here, I get the same experience in Firefox as I would have on a Windows machine. So I'm not going to go so far as to log into my Firefox account, whatever, but I don't know. You can go to Google. Seemed weird. There, it's loading Google. We can do Google stuff. Uh, if you want to go to Gmail, well, I'm not going to log into Gmail for you, but you get the idea. Facebook, the usual things you do on the web, they'll work in Linux the same way they work anywhere else. That's the whole point of the web. It's meant to be portable. It's not supposed to change based on what operating system you're on. Uh, no, I wanted to minimize. Oh, there's no minimize buttons. That's, a, that's actually a thing you have to enable in Fedora. There's a tweak tool that lets you bring your minimize button back. I never understood why they did away with that. All right, so um, I should be able to log into Steam using this QR code and not have to type my password on screen. Steam. Steam Guard. There we go. It's going to work. go. There's Steam. I'm going to minimize this. Close that. So now, theoretically, I don't know, let's pick a small game and install it. Hyper drive, install. I just want to see if this works, to be honest. <laughs> I'd be super stoked if it does. All right, so I'm getting kind of off topic here. I think I've covered the basics. I would love to hear if you have anything else you'd like to see on Fedora, on Linux, on whatever, right? I do have some ideas for some more advanced things that I want to record, but this is meant to be a super basic, like I want to get started. I want to fire up my machine 
I don't want to lose my Windows partition and I want to um, install Linux. Oh, I guess that's one thing we should test. Can I still boot Windows? Hang on, once this is done installing, we're gonna see if I can still boot into Windows. <laughs> All right, let's reboot and let's see if I can still boot Windows. And what should happen is that boot manager should come up, that little text window that was that I was editing before. You should be able to just select Windows Boot Manager. Is that what that says? Windows Boot Manager. Cross your fingers. Let's look promising. Spinny thing. Now you will find sometimes when you do a Windows update it'll clobber the boot manager. And then what you'll have to do is go back into Linux using a live, live USB and use grub. Uh, grub install, I think is the command you need. I don't know if that's still a problem. It used to be a big one. Every time you do Windows updates, or not every time, but frequently you do Windows updates and it will clobber your, your grub boot manager. Um, but you can fix it by getting back into Linux and doing a grub install. Uh, you'll have to look that up if it happens. If it happens to this one, maybe I'll record a quick video on how to do it and you'll be able to see it. All right, so we should be good. Put in my pin and there you go. There's my my friends list again. I have to blur that every time. Cool. And now if we reboot, we should be able to boot back into Linux again. I feel bad about rebooting Windows right away because it doesn't deal well with stuff like that. restart it should by default take us to the Linux uh, option you can change that default it's in your grub config it's all text-based I don't think there's a GUI to let you change that yet at least there wasn't last time I did this but you can set it so that it'll boot Windows by default instead of booting Linux by default if you'd rather have it do that um, again comfort zone thing Sometimes uh, if a machine reboots in the middle of the night or if it goes to sleep, that's another thing. If Windows goes to sleep and you wake it up, uh, it'll, it'll bring you back to that bootloader. And if Linux is set as the default, it'll boot Linux instead of Windows. So Linux, Windows will be left in this weird, like, half-asleep state. When you boot back in, it's going to have to try to resume from. I don't know if that really causes any problems, but it always felt like a bad state to me. All right, so... I just want to get back into Linux because I wanted to show you that it still boots. So there you go. I can boot either way and it works, right? Now this should bring Steam back up as a startup item. I am going to let Steam sync and see if I can play some Valheim. All right, so back to, oh, it detected my VR headset. That's awesome. Awesome. That's one thing I was worried about. I didn't know if I'd be able to play VR in Fedora. I have a friend who's been, who's going through this right now. Is what maybe what put it in the, in my brain to go buy this hard drive. Um, well, you might remember him, Uncle Mark from the show. Um, so yeah, I I may try out VR at some point on Linux. That would be super awesome. Go ahead. All right, so I hope I hope you have found something informative in this video. It's going to be a nightmare for me to edit this thing, uh, to try to cut it down to something that I feel like is useful because I probably have an hour and a half of footage at this point. But uh, I hope you have enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Let me know if you have any questions or if there's anything else you want me to try to cover in a future video. I do have some more advanced things in mind that come down to like identity domains and stuff on Linux. If you're a new user and you just have questions, Feel free to ask. I've been there. I've been through a lot of this stuff, and I would love to help you, and I'd love to answer questions. So reach out. Let me know. Either comment below or go to ironsystemin.com and try to reach out to me that way. And until next time, I guess, uh, you know, have fun at the Linux command prompt, and I'll catch you next time.